Welcome to the Berry Good Food Foundation Future Thought Leaders 10th panel. This is the 10th one we've done. So I'm gonna start by introducing from my right to my left. On my far right is Dr. Gordon Sachs, and he's from the UCSD Center for Integrative Nutrition. He's a preventative integrative medicine physician. He's the director of the UCSD Center for Integrative Nutrition. He's also the chair of the Krupp Endowment, and he's a member of the Society for Integrative Oncology. He has many, many, many more um, things in his bio, but that's the short version. Please consult the long one online because I'm gonna move on to our next doctor on the panel. This is Mark Kalina, MD, and he's with the Perlman Clinic. He's an internal medicine physician specializing in holistic primary care. He was a primary care doctor for 17 years at Scripps. He was an integrative palliative care uh, specialist at the San Diego Cancer Center. And most recently, when I think we met, he was an integrative specialist at Pacific Pearl with then Mimi Guineri, who used to be the head of Scripps Integrative Health. On my right is Matthew Alvarado. He is a spiritual healer from the Kumeyaay Nation Waipuk clan. He is also with the San Pasquale Reservation Fire Department for 14 years, a specialist in technical rescue and fire operation, and has instructed 40 plus fire academies, led youth programs for aspiring firefighters. And he is here to talk a bit about his work with mushrooms today, and we're really happy to have him. On my left, I have Dave and Waite. He is the chef owner of The Plot restaurant in Oceanside, as well as Wrench and Rodent. He began his career as a sushi chef in Santa Barbara, then later in La Jolla. I think that's when I first got to know you. Um, he then founded Wrench and Rodent with his wife, Jessica, who's a part of our board. Um, he has instructed sustainable cooking techniques to elementary school students, culinary students, and city officials. He is a zero waste operation and an impressive, impressive chef. He opened the plot, a plant-based restaurant, in 2020, where mushrooms are very much on the menu, and in fact, not just ones that one typically would think of as culinary mushrooms, but also ones that are more typically thought of as medicinal mushrooms, and yet he has made them quite delightful, and I can, t I can attest to that personally. <laughs> Next, we have Danielle Stevenson. She's an applied mycologist. She's an environmental toxicology PhD student at UC Riverside studying fungi in soil remediation. Her research is extraordinary and we're gonna hear about it today. She's also the founder of DIY Fungi, mushroom education, consulting, selling of mushroom cultures. She's the founder and advisor to the Healing City Soils Project and she is a Future Leaders Fellow with a Foundation for Food and Agriculture. So thank you, Danielle, and very excited to hear your participation today. Next, we have Ivo Fadok. He is the farmer and owner-operator at Mindful Mushrooms with over 15 years of farming experience. They currently have direct sales at a number of farmers markets here in the San Diego area and a, a, a number of restaurants, including The Plot, Enclave, and Lola 55. And he's currently developing Mindful Substrates, the growing medium for mushrooms, which will be growing or producing a growing medium for wholesale and retail for those who may want to grow mushrooms at home and or as a soil additive for those of us farming otherwise or with gardens. Finally, I have Jan Hall, who is the CEO of Ohm Mushrooms with 30 years of experience in the industry. Ohm is organic mushrooms, USDA certified organic, non-GMO certified. They grow 11 species of mushrooms at their facility. They dehydrate them and make a number of supplements, single mushroom supplements, combined supplements for a number of medicinal and other uses. And I know that Davin uses some of their products at his restaurant, others do as well. They're available in the stores and we've all tried them. So we're so excited to hear from farmers, growers, mycologists, chefs, spiritual leaders, and doctors to talk about the ways in which mushrooms um, not only are here as a soil regulator, healing the planet, helping plants grow, helping, uh, helping regenerate the soil, as Danielle will talk about. They have, of course, grow in themselves and we eat them for nutrition and for medicine. And then we will finally also talk about some of the psychedelic mushrooms, including psilocybin, because we can't have a dialogue about mushrooms and not really include the entirety of the spectrum of what we're here to talk about. So very, very excited to have everyone here today. Let's start with Evo. I'm 
we talked a little bit about what's involved in growing mushrooms. And I don't, I don't grow mushrooms and probably many of our audience don't as well. Tell us about it. It's a complicated process. Yeah, definitely can be. Um, so basically it starts with a culture. So you can grow the culture either in liquid or on a Petri dish. And it's basically just the mycelium, which is technically like the root system of the fruiting mushroom. And you take that culture and then you transfer that into a grain, usually like a, we use millet. So it's a small little seed, which uh, the Petri dish then eventually colonizes that entire bag of sterilized millet. So we sterilize it in autoclaves. So it kills any competitors so that the mushrooms just have an open territory to decompose everything. And once they fully colonize that, we take that grain spawn and that gets transferred into like a bulk substrate, which depending on what kind of mushroom you're growing, like these ones, like lion's mane or oyster mushrooms, those are typically, they grow on dead trees in I nature. I should say, these are all his mushrooms. These are all the mushrooms that he grew and brought, brought to us today. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they basically, in nature, they grow on dead trees, so rotting trees. So what we do is we take byproducts from lumber mills, so like oak, lumber mills and we get their sawdust and we mix that sawdust with a nutrient source whether it's soy or bran or whatever we can get our hands on mix those all together and then that substrate gets pasteurized so again it kind of kills all the competitors that might be in there like our major competitors would be like trichoderma which is a green bread mold that you'll see growing on your bread if you leave it out and then there's also tons of different types of bacteria all sorts of stuff that basically are competing to decompose what you're making. So you kind of try and keep it as perfect for just the mushroom to grow. Then after the grain is sterilized, the grain gets introduced into that substrate in a lab. So we have like HEPA filtration, it's super clean. So nothing's floating around in there. We're all masked up with gloves and all that. And we pour little bits of this grain into the bulk substrate then that grain bag gets sealed and it's got this like special filter that, because mushrooms produce tons of CO2 when they are decomposing. So it lets the CO2 out, but doesn't let any of the bad stuff in. And then strain dependent, like our faster strains, like the oyster mushroom, they'll take two weeks to fully colonize. Some of the longer ones like shiitake, chestnuts, mataki, they take eight, nine, 10 weeks. And when they're fully colonized in these bags, then they get moved into the fruit room where they basically get cut open and certain, certain mushrooms like to grow out of the top, certain mushrooms like to grow out of the sides, some like to hang. So we kind of adjust it per strain, cut the bags open and in this room, it stays around 65 degrees, very humid. So we have these fog mister machines that basically replicate like a perfect environment like in the forest. And then eventually you'll start seeing little pins form, which pins are like baby mushrooms. And then once those little pins form, pretty much all strains within a week will be fully grown. So from like barely seeable little specks to fully grown mushrooms in like a week. It's amazing. I'm curious, Jan, if you would chime in about the growing process at home, which I know, of course, you start growing live mushrooms before they're then dehydrated to make your supplements. How does your growing process compare to, to Evo? Similar, different? In many respects, it is it is similar. I, I think uh, maybe our difference is in the front end and the back end. So we actually have some of our own master proprietary strains that were gathered by our co-founders years ago. So an example would be Antrodia camphorata, uh, which traditionally comes from Taiwan. And so we have these amazing proprietary strains. We keep them in cryogenic storage. Mm and then we bring them in and then we start to follow a process quite similar to the one that Evo just described. Um, we do the, the tissue cultures and then we inoculate um, organic whole oats for, that we ship in from Canada. So it's from a pristine area of Canada and that's the growing substrate. So we inoculate the substrate and we grow 11 species, as you, were, as you were talking about earlier. And then we grow them in, in grow bags, which actually sound quite similar. So I'm going to show you one. Oh, good. Exciting. I'm going to show you two, actually. So this is, this is a grow bag. So they, 
we inoculate the, the oats, we introduce the tissue culture. So let's say it's, it's reishi, which this one is. And then they grow in their own little microclimate. This is like, like a special grow bag. This is the patch that the mushrooms breathe through. So you were talking about taking in oxygen and emitting carbon dioxide. Um, and then they grow in the grow room. We have a team of mycologists. Our lead mycologist has been growing mushrooms for over 40 years, both culinary and uh, medicinal or functional. And so when they believe that these mushrooms, and again, it is very species dependent. I mean, our goal is to have happy mushrooms because <laughs> happy <laughs> mushrooms are nutritious and they have all of the bioactive compounds that make them so healthy um, and they pass along those benefits to us as human beings. And so they pick the exact moment to harvest those mushrooms and they dry them, they mill them into a fine powder. So I brought a powder to show you as well. Ah. So this is reishi. This is a reishi superfood mushroom powder. And I should say that we actually mill the entire mushroom. So we grow the mushroom species through their full life cycle. Every stage, the mycelial stage, the primordial stage or baby mushrooms and the fruit body stage. And, um, and then we, we create these amazing superfood powders. So our goal is to optimize and preserve the nutritional and the bioactive compounds. So that when you buy these in the stores, so this is where we're a little bit different because you're, you're buying a superfood powder, not, not the entire mushroom. However, that powder contains <laughs> the entire mushroom. And so our mission is to make a positive difference on everybody's life through the power of mushrooms. And so it's really important that we, when we grow them, we grow them to maximize that, the health benefits. And so we are an FDA registered facility. Our, our quality and food safety standards are off the charts. And our brand, which is called OM, so I'll give you some examples. So the powder would go into... That becomes uh, that. Yeah, exactly. That powder becomes this. And then we have other applications. So this one is, um, this is a veggie miso broth. So it's a combination of animal-based protein and five mushrooms. And this is a hot drink. So they're all mushroom-based powders. But this is why it's important. Because we can talk about this. But if we're not producing products that people want and incorporate into their daily lives, then we've missed it because we're not touching people's lives. They're not incorporating it into their daily diet. This is a perfect lead in for you, David, because I know that you, among others in town and around the globe, use fresh mushrooms and some of the powdered supplements in what you create at your restaurants for your clients. So, you know, for example, the first time that I saw lion's mane on the menu, I, I remember thinking, I have no idea what that is. And, uh, and I like to think of myself as reasonably well informed. So, so the thing is, there must be a learning curve and then getting people to, to try some of these newer mushrooms, whether fresh or powdered, in the work that you do. How do you bring it forward and get people to give it a bite? It's a similar, a similar way of thinking. You know, whatever entices people to want to try it, make it exciting, make it flavorful, make it an enjoyable experience, and get people excited enough about it to try it. And once once people try it, there's it, it's kind of hard to go back. Um, but one um, and whether it's uh, funny fish parts or <laughs> vegan food, it, it's always for me incorporating it back to some sort of comfort food, some sort of childhood nostalgia. Um, the lion's mane mushroom is the crab mm. in the California roll that was up there and um, uh, crab cakes at the plot. And um, it is very meaty. It, 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 and, it, and, and it's great because it, it not just, it's not just enticing them to try a, a mushroom that's loaded with nutrients, mm -hmm. it's enticing them to try a crab cake that doesn't have any crab in it. So there's multiple things going on and the two um, 
kind of uh, and a mushroom that most people think of more as medicinal than culinary i mean i think that's yeah. where the magic for you is is that you're getting to we know what culinary mushrooms are we've been to the grocery store for everyone has seen the white button mushroom that has predominated but now in most grocery stores we get to see a few more some better than others but seeing these otherwise traditional medicinal mushrooms on your menu or being used that way i think is super exciting oh it, it's so much fun and you, you told me earlier about the journey that you personally had in terms of, for example, going from a traditional energy drink with a lot of, let's say, less desirable ingredients into something that's mushroom based. So tell me about that. I think this is interesting, too. Yeah, it um, I mean, I, I kind of like the bigger picture is like, you know, business plans, at least in this country, haven't typically, you know, there's a lot of businesses out there that don't really do anything for the health of the end consumer. And we're lucky in our bubble because we're surrounded by people who care. Um, and, and hopefully that bubble is growing outward. Um, but being able to cook with stuff that, you know, is doing something good for the bodies of the people who are eating it as opposed to something, something bad. Um, I mean, it kind of started um, with the crab cakes. If you eat three of the orders of crab cakes, you're going to feel like you drank an energy drink. And um, I mean, being a being a cook, you know, like we're not the healthiest people a lot of the time. I mean, anybody who wants the details, read Kitchen Confidential. <laughs> um, Great book. But um, <laughs> no, I I definitely was a bit of a caffeine junkie. Probably still am, you know. But um, with with COVID and um, you know, not much change changed for my wife, my partners, my brother, and me. It was just everyone else kind of got got a vacation and it was great because we were stoked just to be in business and then there was the staff shortage so it was a good two-year run of i mean it was really cool because i got to get my hands on every aspect of the business but i burned myself out and as a chef you're not really you're supposed to be a robot you know you're not <laughs> supposed to admit weakness and definitely not in front of other people and like i say read kitchen confidential but um you know i i got to the point with energy drinks where um it just didn't do much for me anymore. And I think I'd used up my serotonin and I'd used <laughs> up all my adrenaline. And it, it's like, what's the point of this? And then somebody walks in with Ohm, uh, the energy powder. Um, Cause we've, that's Ohm is a company going back in the, in the past, like down to the fish joint days, Tara and um, friend Tony, Tara works for Ohm. And we kind of been able to see this cool idea that became home get started and take a few twists and turns and all of a sudden it's like it's almost like now the whole world kind of knows how cool ohm is you know and it was always in our backyard so tony brings these things by to try and you know i'm trying to quit energy drinks and i'm bummed you know like i'm trying to get through the day and this little packet of mushroom powder shows up and um well i haven't had any energy drinks in a while and um the other health aspects are are great too because you know crashing is definitely not fun. Right, in the you don't get the crash, yeah. you know, with the energy you get from the mushrooms. A lot more even keel. Mm -hmm. I liked, and I noticed that you had some of the chaga-based coffee drinks, and some people are having pure chaga-only drinks, and sometimes it's chaga with a shot of caffeine, and you know, there's no judgment either way. But I think this is kind of a good thing you're getting. In addition to that energy jolt that many of us still want from caffeine, we're getting the additional one that comes from some of these great mushrooms, and you're getting sort of a smoother ride, unlike the energy drink with its sugar, and you know, sort of up and down, and it doesn't really give you the 18 hours that you need for your average work day. I it, it's just crazy how well <laughs> All the human body works when you just give it what it needs you know wow it's so simple isn't it <laughs> <laughs> well so i want to pop back for a second to danielle because you too began your journey in this work as a mushroom farmer and that brought you in into the bigger projects that you're working on now so i i want to hear you talk about that a little bit from a farming to start and then even into what you're doing now sure uh so yeah i started out as a farmer like a veggie you know veggie grower um, and involved in a lot of urban farming and um, that's how I learned that soil is degraded <laughs> we have a major problem most of the soil that we need to grow our food that farmers need um, is degraded and is um, I think I it's like 
60 or 90 percent or something of soil globally is degraded. Um, so I, I became aware of this issue um, as I was in getting involved in agriculture. I also became aware that, um, you know, degraded soils can contain contaminants like different metals and other types of contaminants that can you know, impact our health if we're eating food that's grown in these contaminated soils. So I thought, what can we do about this? <laughs> and that question, what can we do about soil uh, to improve soil health, to reverse soil degradation led me to fungi. I did not know anything about fungi, um, you know, 12 years ago. I started learning and just, um, I learned that to work with fungi to clean up and restore soil, you have to know how they live. And so I started learning about fungal ecology and um, I started growing a lot of mycelium. <laughs> and um, my life kind of switched to being uh, this person that you know, basically is is spreading mycelium everywhere. <laughs> um, and, Spawning. <laughs> yeah. And so I just for those of you who may not be familiar, I'd love to take a little journey. I mean, a lot of the living parts of fungi, so the mycelium that Evo mentioned, um, are out of sight. So we don't know about them and the essential roles they play. So if you can just imagine like beneath your feet right now is probably hopefully a web of fungal mycelium connecting all the plants um, on the farm and the trees. Uh, those ones are called mycorrhizal. So myco fungal rhizal related to roots. And you may have heard of like the wood wide web and these notions of mother trees and these networks of fungi that are communicating between plants. Um, yeah, so those are really important fungi, hopefully beneath us right now. We also have decomposer fungi, like the same kind of guys you're seeing in this basket here. Decomposer fungi um, decompose organic matter. They break down dead plants and turn it into soil. And we really would not have soil if it were not for these decomposer fungi. There's so many um, other fungi that all work together. I mean, in nature, Every organism's life creates food and habitat for another organism's life. And so really um, my work and my research today and over the last decade or so has been about basically allying with these fungi, these different types of fungi, um, and trying to relink cycles so that we are, for instance, um, growing protein-rich food and medicine on safe waste, um, solving a problem, that, solving two problems there. And you mean substrate in that waste you're talking about? Yes, Okay, absolutely. so explain substrate what that means for, what is, what is substrate? Substrate is, get the, there. is the food <laughs> for the, for decompose, you know, for the mushroom you're trying to grow. The mushroom is just the fruit body. The substrate is the, the food that the mycelium, that living part is growing on and getting its food from. So for all, for all decomposer fungi, um, their food is carbon, basically. It's dead stuff, dead plants. Um, so that means that we can use everything from spent coffee grounds to, um, you know, sawdust from from the lumber industry, um, from agricultural waste like I don't know corn stalks um, to grow food to grow these mushrooms. And then the best part is uh, you can then apply that mycelium once the blocks what um, have stopped fruiting, we can then apply that mycelium to degraded soil. And these decomposers will go to work on organic contaminants like diesel. Um, they'll go to work and um, build really healthy soil and help restore soil. Well, that so that's sense. a good point. Not only are they taking contaminants out of the soil in, in that instance, or in some instances, you said, I think lead, you know, sort of kind of grabbing it so that it stays out of the water system, but they can also help regenerate soil, increase the organic content so that for those folks at home with the garden or farmers generally, they're increasing, you know, the capacity of that soil to grow, like adding compost. That's essentially the yeah. same concept. Yeah. yeah which is brilliant. <laughs> yeah, it increases the capacity of the soil to ho hold moisture. I'm, I'm working on a number of projects in California right now, working with um, fungal mycelium to help prevent toxic, like metal contaminated ash from all the wildfires from getting into watersheds. Um, I'm because working- Because the mushrooms grab them. 
Yeah, well, that same <laughs> web that we're talking about, it's, I mean, it has passageways um, that are sm like finer, smaller than anything a human can produce. So it's essentially a giant filter in the soil um, that can basically grab on to metals and, and whether it's living or dead and, and block them from running off into, you know, into streams. Um, the other thing too is that the, the mycorrhizal fungi I mentioned that connect with plants and help them grow uh, also play really neat roles. Part of my research um, in LA where there's a lot of contaminated sites, <laughs> you may well, know. Let's, let's not pick on LA, that's probably true of every it's major true city, everywhere. Right? every urban area. It's true everywhere. <laughs> it's an uncomfortable reality to face. Um, but it, for me, it's very inspiring that we can ally with life. We can work with fungi and plants and other organisms uh, to, to help clean up soil and, and protect human health as well and uh, sort of support the, regenerations, the regeneration of ecosystems. I just have to say that listening to you talk reminds me that ma mushrooms are indeed magic. And so <laughs> they do so many great things on planet Earth for, for the ground, for the plants, you know, the communication, the filtering, the cleaning. And I love that you talked about increasing carbon content because we all know that if we increase, you know, the sort of viability of the soil, that it sequesters more carbon from the atmosphere well as well, which can, of course, help deal with another growing problem that we're all aware of, which is too much carbon up there. We need less there and more here. So because it's a good thing underground, not so great in the sky, as we all have come to understand. That is very exciting stuff. Now, I want to go over to our doctors for a second, because we've heard a lot about a couple different mushrooms, how they grow. And there's been some hints at the ways in which these mushrooms are good for our health. So I'd like to hear from, how about you, Dr. Sachs? You want to begin and tell us what you know about some of the mushrooms culinary, medicinal, or otherwise, and what they do for the health, and then we'll get into your special project. But first, I just want to hear about what, what you can tell us about some of the mushrooms we've, we've talked about today. Sure. Um, well, I find this discussion fascinating on so many levels, <laughs> and I come at it more from the medical side, although I'm keenly aware of the importance. I love what you said about allying ourselves with another life, another life on this planet, and um, how, and we have co-evolved with mushrooms over many millions of years, so it's, they are our natural uh, partner. Allies. Our allies. <laughs> and, uh, and, and for those who subscribe to the theory of evolution, it's held, and not everyone does, but it's held that um, we evolved. If we go back maybe 600 million years, we evolved from fungi. So interestingly, the same things that prey on us bacteria, viruses, other microbes, even certain fungi. Fungi themselves have been attacked even longer than we have by these predators. And so they've, they've evolved amazing defenses. And when we take mushrooms in, they ha we have receptors on our immune cells. They can help to activate and modulate our immune systems to behave more effectively and as a result have antiviral, antimicrobial, antibacterial effects. Think of penicillin. Where does it come from? So, um, but the applications go way beyond that. Over 30 years ago, I had the misfortune of having uh, an eye disease, juvenile glaucoma, that unfortunately, you know, b before I could get eye surgery for it, really had a bad impact on my sight. Although this eye still sees pretty well. But one of the problems with having eye surgery in that condition is many years later, you can develop a cataract. And fortunately, over 30 years have gone by and I haven't had, until recently, a problem with that. Now, uh, several years ago, I noticed you know, this was developing and was thinking about, well, maybe I should just have eye surgery and remove that. But in my case, having prior eye surgery, it's not so simple. And I thought, well, maybe there's a non-surgical way to approach this. And so I delved into the literature and I discovered an article that had come out from researchers in China who had studied a group of children in China where the children, but not their parents, developed cataracts. The kids were four or five years old, but oddly, their parents didn't get cataracts the way they did. What's going on? The children and the parents were genetically sequenced and the children, but not the parents, lacked the ability to make 
a key um, enzyme called lenosterol synthase needed for the production of lenosterol, which is important for the health of the eyes. And, and I, then, then the researchers who did this then took lenosterol and applied it to lens specimens from humans who had their cataract removed. And when they applied it, the cross-linked fibers that made up the cataract started to uncross-link. And then they gave it an eye drop of lenosterol to animals, like, um, like dogs. And they noticed over a number of weeks, they were starting to melt away their cataracts. So here I am thinking, boy, I sure could use some of those lenosterol <laughs> eye drops. Hmm. And then I realized, now wait a minute. I don't want to be the guinea pig for this in humans. Um, I only have one good sighted eye. I don't want to put that at risk. <laughs> and besides, the FDA takes a long time to approve new drugs, new medications. It's going to be years before they'll ever approve this. So I started thinking, I wonder if there's some way to get lenosterol in nature and started to delve into this. And then I discovered the leading candidate, the richest source of lenosterol by far are shaga mushrooms. And then when I learned about that, I learned uh, about other mushrooms and their healing powers. And I, I learned some amazing things. I already knew about some of the antimicrobial properties. I knew that they had some role. I had learned in medical school about how mushrooms may be helpful for enhancing immunity and important for anti-cancer immunity. And I started putting these things together and realized this is a very important area that we have to research. And it totally intuitively made sense to me that they are our allies and that we can work together to have beneficial outcomes, not only for our own health, but at the same time, we're enhancing the health of the environment. And, and I also hold the belief, and I don't think it's just, it's not just me. I learned this in <laughs> studying a little. Don't be afraid. <laughs> into studying Chinese medicine and Ayurveda, ancient healing systems, where they look at the different tastes and flavors, and they attribute different healing properties to the different tastes. And interestingly, one taste that isn't fully represented in that system, but the Japanese have a word for it, is called umami, which is a savory quality that people usually get from eating animal food. But in, but in, the, in the plant kingdom, it's found in mushrooms. We bow in reverence to our, to our great, 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 great grandfather, who was indeed a fun <laughs> guy. Um, I, I have to ask, the follow-up, of course, is did you, in fact, begin a chaga regimen? And, and is it, because we talked about chaga. Chaga doesn't look like this. Chaga is a little bit stickier. And, and so you get it in a powder. You can make a coffee-like drink or a powdered supplement and hot liquid or a tea. Did you try chaga to deal with your concern? Yeah, and chaga is, um, the, the most potent chaga is one that's kind of under attack and it's in limited amounts. And it's that which grows like in uh, old growth forests and it's the wild version. We can cultivate chaga <clears throat> and grow it um, on, on a, you know, on a uh, medium like brown rice or millet or other, other carbon sources. But, but really the best chaga is found in old growth forests and it's, it's sought after and often denuded, the trees are denuded. What happens is chaga spores in the soil will notice a wound on a tree, like a, a birch tree. The tree, maybe a, there's a, a, an ice storm in the, you know, an old northern forest. The tree will lose its limb. And it's almost like the shaga smell out, like a, a, like a, a pheromonal scent. And they bind, they find a way to attach to that side of the birch tree. And they grow a cap that's almost like a Band-Aid, a permanent Band-Aid on the side of the tree. But in fact, it's an amalgam of two life forces, that of the tree and that of the shaga, together forming a complex. And interestingly, it's the highest, it has the highest amount of lanosterol and, and melanin and superoxide dismutase, all of which are needed for the health of the eyes. So that grows on the side of these trees. I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, but... no you are. I mean, I, I was curious if you, if you, you know, oh, went so, yes. and tried so the, the... After that, I... I used, I tried to find from not cultivated shaga, but, but from the uh, old growth forest. And I would, you know, order shaga chunks and, and, like and powders. And I made shaga tea out of it, uh, coffee. It's almost like coffee-like flavor. I found that for me, the simplest way to use it was to take it as either a capsule or a tincture. And I do use a little bit of shaga every day. 
I can't say that it has melted away my cataract, but I'm probably not using enough of it. But it's been relatively stable for a number of years, and I would love to be able to do a study where using like a, an eye drop and also ingesting it, and, and by the way, um, some of these factors do cross the blood aqueous barrier and get into the eye, I would love to be able to do a study on that and really check that out. Now I have two follow-ups that actually to other panelists on what you said. You, because we talked about chagas and birch trees and how they're actually parasitic and yet they're not harmful in the way that one might think with parasite. And then I wanna ask you, because I have a feeling you have some thoughts on the way that you grow them when you grow them as well. And you grow chagas. No, you, okay. First you as to the birch trees and the parasitic nature. I'm curious about this. This is really fascinating. Sure. Well, fungi are fascinating. They really evade categorization. So <laughs> what I mean is that fungi will change. There's four main sort of um, categories of fungi by ecological role. So there's the decomposers, the mycorrhizal fungi, the parasi parasitic fungi, and the endophytes, endo inside fight plant. They grow inside of plants. Um, parasites are really interesting because, I mean, some some really powerful med medicinal fungi like cordyceps, right? Y'all know the, like, the one that takes over the brains of insects and makes them act all weird and crawl up high and then the mushroom fruits out of their brain and <laughs> spread spores and then we, we eat it. It's like a very powerful medicine. So that's a parasite. Um, you can cat you could consider chaga a parasite as well um but really parasites play really important ecological roles if we zoom out right they help um maintain balance every time a tree is felled in a forest soil can be created uh there's habitat for you know woodpeckers and um owls to burrow and all sorts of other life so um, yeah, I think parasites are often maligned, but <laughs> we got, if, we zoom here, out, <laughs> if we zoom out, they play really important roles. And just again, on that, uh, the fungi defying categorization, I mean, I've been learning lately that there's like decomposer fungi. So fungi that um, typically would grow on, um, you know, like leaf litter or a dead tree or something that totally cycle through different categories. They'll um, at a, some stage be a parasite where they're growing on a living tree. They want to eat it, so they'll take it down eventually. Then they're in the soil. They'll fruit a mushroom, throw spores to get back up in the tree, and then crawl inside and live in the leaves of tree of the tree as endophytes, not causing harm, but actually um, existing in an exchange like they get room and board in exchange for helping the the plant photosynthesize so i could i could go on about how amazing fungi are in um yeah helping bring balance into ecosystems and you know just really defying categorization but, but specifically with the with the chaga mushrooms and the birch trees, mm -hmm. which seems parasitic and latch on the way you said. And what has happened is because of the popularity of the mushroom, there's been a lot of harvesting in the wild. And actually, as you said, it's sort of a Band-Aid. When those are harvested in that way, sometimes it creates harm, potential harm for the tree. So there is sort of a positive and negative in that. And that's something that we talked about in terms of the relationship between that mushroom and that tree in the wild. So that's a different thing. And, and that's, but I wanna ask you now that you know, we, we heard about what he just said about the difference between cultivated, you know, or naturally occurring on birch trees or otherwise, and those might be cultivated. What, what, do you know anything about that differentiation? And is there a way that you deal with that in the way that you and your mycologist team grows them? Um, absolutely. Uh, I mean, one thing I didn't mention before was in our growing process, the reason that we choose um, whole oats is because they, they contain the husk. And so it makes the mushrooms work really hard. It's, it's a, like attaching to the, you know, the birch trees. So what we do is try to mimic the, the natural uh, growing conditions as you would see it in nature. Uh, and so chaga is absolutely chock full of, of um, antioxidants. It's well known for it. And so the chaga that we produce is the same um, and it contains the whole mushroom. So we don't try and extract and isolate to one particular ingredient because 
we actually think we can't do better than Mother Nature. <laughs> and, we, and we don't even understand at this point sure. the kind of synergies of the entire mushroom. And, just, and that's a really important point. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the reason potentially that chaga um, is so useful is because it prevents the production of harmful cytokines, mm -hmm. which is a trigger for inflammation. And inflammation in the human body is, it destroys. <laughs> And so it, it works again with your body in, in introducing these antioxidants into your diet, and then they go to work. So it sounds to me that if you're going to do this study that you want to do, that maybe what you can do is have both the naturally occurring and the ones that are grown and try them both out for the study and see. I mean, right? You know, that might be exciting stuff. I think that um, you raise a really important point that uh, we ha really have to find ways to grow these, to cultivate these, because there's such a small amount in the old growth forest and we have to respect that and leave that be as much as possible. And so if we're gonna have this in a form that's a real medicine that amplifies uh, lenosterol or other compounds that may be important, then we need to find ways to grow them safely and effectively. And, um, and I like the idea of growing them like on a whole grain medium that has the husk and all that, and that, the, that the spores have to work harder and the mushroom has, to, you know, the, the fungi has to work harder to, to grow um, its mycelium that way. And, um, and I think we need to test that and perhaps we need to do a combination of preclinical or laboratory testing and looking at a range of different compounds, not just saying, oh, it's the lanostrol and nothing else. There's a synergism of the parts. But I think we also then need to test it out in, trials of studies of disease. Conditions. One point I wanted to make, it's my last thing here, and that is... No, I've got a follow-up for you, oh, so go okay. ahead. And that is that <laughs> I don't think of Shaga as a parasite. It's more of a, I don't know quite what the technical term, but it's more of a uh, symbiotic relationship and mutually supportive. Remember that the Shaga is helping the tree out by forming a band-aid to help this tree to stay alive, and then the tree is providing certain nutrients that help support that phase of the life cycle of the Shaga. So it's a win-win. So it's a yin-yang, less parasitic. All right, we're gonna, we, we were, we were, you know, happy parasite, parasitic relationship. Um, not all parasites are bad, as, as we, we've heard. Um, and before we get into the magic mushrooms that I know a lot of you wanna hear us talk about today, I wanna ask you about the research that you're currently working on with mushrooms and COVID vaccine, because this is incredible. It's current and a very exciting stuff. I'm trained as an epidemiologist as well as uh, medicine. And uh, so when the things were happening in Wuhan toward the very end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020, as soon as I heard that it had gotten out of Wuhan and that uh, for Chinese New Year, people were leaving Wuhan on trains to the countryside, it hit me like a ton of bricks, like, oh my God, this thing is out of control and borders will not stop it. And I realized I saw this is gonna be a pandemic. And it was, it was really maybe a month later before the dimensions of that struck the, nat the national media out here and we had our first cases leaking into the United States, but the handwriting was on the wall. And so when that happened, I started thinking about there's got to be a natural way to approach this that we could help contribute. And of course, mushrooms were at the top of the list. Um, we held a conference at UC San Diego. We had partners from all across the University of California system that had integrative medicine research programs. So we had UC Irvine, UCLA, UC San Francisco, UC Davis. We had all of the different centers come together and share research. The outgrowth of that conference, which was at the beginning of February of 2020, the last time we were all together in person before almost today, um, was that we agreed we wanted to do cro like collaborative research across the University of California system and share and pool our resources in the area of integrative medicine. And of course, COVID was on everybody's lips at that time. Very quickly, I was approached by colleagues from UCLA from their Center for East-West Medicine who came forward and told me, we have a study concept, and we, they knew that we had this large endowment, the Krupp Endowment at UC San Diego to support this kind of research. And they said, we have a project that is based on what happened in Wuhan, where they used a Chinese herbal formula to treat acutely ill COVID patients, and it appeared to work. And 
Of course, Chinese medicine is much more, um, herbal medicine is much more widely accepted and immediately available in Wuhan than in the US. But we realized for this to be accepted in the United States, to find out if it even works, we need to do rigorous clinical trials on it. And so we, we decided to partner across the campuses and do a study where we looked at the, the Chinese herbal and also something that I was cooking up, which was on the use of medicinal mushrooms. So we had two different treatment arms, both of which are studies that are nearing completion right now, both of which are uh, randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind clinical trials, both of which have now been FDA-approved, the trials, the study, as quote-unquote investigational new drugs to look at the safety of these as treatments for COVID in phase one clinical trials. Fantastic. And, and after that, and so these are, we're getting, we're nearing uh, the completion of that phase of things. After that, we realized, you know, the, the vaccines were coming into the, into the fore. And, and we were thinking they have lots of limitations, even if they work really well, and you know, and they worked surprisingly well, even with all of the issues that may be attendant to them, we realized they could be made better. They, the, the immunity we know wanes over time. Not everybody has the effect. They have side effects. Um, not everybody has side effects, but some people do. Mushrooms, we thought, could enhance the background immunity of people. And we realized if we could give people mushrooms, just simple capsules, for a few days around the time of their vaccination, we might boost their background immunity and give the vaccines more raw material to work with and essentially augment the vaccines. And so we Increase have efficacy. Increase, increase the number of antibodies, which is a marker for how likely it is to prevent people from getting infected or getting life-threatening infections. We think, we're looking at, can we increase that? Can we prevent the decline, the waning of immunity over time so they last longer? Can we reduce the side effects and can we increase the kinds of immunological responses that occur not just to antibodies, but to a range of different immune cells so that it increases the diversity of the response against the, the COVID variant or against virally infected cells in the body? So we have two randomized trials now in this. Uh, one has near, is nearing or just about completed, which is looking at people newly vaccinated and we're launching right now a fourth study to look at people who are getting the booster. Question, can we boost the booster? <laughs> and if this works out, and we don't know, it's a study. It may, it may not. Sure. We do not know yet. But we know but, they're magic. We know that already. And so. we, know that they're, <laughs> we know that they're immune enhancing and we strongly sure. suspect they're safe. Yeah. So if, the, if it pans out that they really have these effects, this is something that could be used with any, potentially any COVID vaccine, the mRNA, other kinds, AstraZeneca, whichever ones, uh, Sinopharm. Also, this is something that could be used for future vaccines, vaccines for other conditions. Uh, it could be used to, um, it could be used to augment vaccines used not just for current infectious diseases, the next pandemic, for vaccines used in cancer treatment, vaccines used to treat autoimmune disease. And this is something because mushrooms are dirt cheap. They can be grown anywhere, basically where there's water, anywhere on planet Earth. Not if, so easy as we've heard from our farmers. But, a little but bit way hard, but. easier, way easier than making an mRNA vaccine. <laughs> okay, by orders fair enough. of magnitude and far less costly. Can be done in my garage, unlike the vaccine. I got and you. And so <laughs> if, we can, if we can unleash this, help unleash this, this is something that could be global in impact or just prophylactically for increased, you know, immune boosting for the entire population, regardless of which uh, vaccine or side, treatment we're talking about. And no? Michelle, the side benefit is it increases awareness and use of mushrooms, which we think then will help the mission of helping it for soil reclamation, for restoration, for climate change, for all the other critical needs that it can serve. Well, that was a beautiful way to wrap it up. And now I'm going to turn to my two folks on my right who we haven't heard from yet. Our other doctor, Dr. Kalina, who um, I'd like to hear about it because I know that you use mushrooms or mushrooms, both um, medicinal mushrooms and other mushrooms 
in terms of your practice for whole health, integrative health with patients and so forth. So tell me about your work and knowledge with mushrooms. Wow. Yeah, I like to, I work in the regular primary care world, trying to figure out how to help people be well, which is a little tricky since we really don't have a definition of what it means to be well, <laughs> uh, although I could give you mine, and I think we could all, everyone could give us. But so in people come in and they have regular things. They have, you know, at the end, or more seriously, they have cancer or they have heart disease or, and this audience, you know, we, we get COVID or I've had COVID twice actually. So I've learned a lot about it by personal experience, but we, we get these conditions or we get stuck in these diagnoses. And the truth is there's so many ways to get well. That's number one, that's a number one truth is there's so many ways to get well, not just the standard medical paradigm, which is ill to the pill, or, the, or then you could generalize to the naturopathic world, sick to the supplement, and we don't, it's, it's bigger. I like the way you move your hands, Gordon. I mean, I like the way you, I like the way you think. You, you, you we're both from the Midwest, we're both doctors, but we couldn't be less alike. And that's what makes the world beautiful is that we need all forms and fashions and all ways of healing. And the truth is disease is reversible in almost all situations. And of course, I'm also an end of life doctor and I do know that people die and we can help them do that even better. And actually mushrooms, I, will, I, I could just say a story of a magic mushroom. I had a lady, a wonderful woman. When who you lived. say magic mushroom, you mean psilocybin. Yeah, I'm okay. talking. I'm talking hallucinating and having okay. an experience. So, right, this is. I am not the doctor to talk about food, although I've worked at places where we talked about food way more than I could even imagine. But I believe in experience and 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 the beauty and the magic of life. And so this woman wonderful lady who'd had cancer three times. This was her third time. She, and she was so scared to die. She was going to die. She had, she was riddled with cancer and, but she was going out in not a good way because fear is not the way to go out. Everything in life is, can we go toward love? Can we go toward connection? Can we go toward oneness or can we, are we going to be over here in separation and fear? And so she had this experience. She went and had a mush, magic mushroom experience. And I feel proud that I was able to tell her where to go. I, I don't know the dosing. I don't, I, I, but there are people, there are shamans, there are wonderful people that are healers. And she had that experience. She did mushrooms. She, had a wonderful experience and then she had a wonderful end of life and it wasn't just wonderful for her it was wonderful for her family her kids and her husband and death is not bad sickness is not bad but we it, it's changing our perspective and i would say magic mushrooms and maybe you could generalize to the other hallucinogens uh peyote ayahuasca ecstasy, which is man-made. These are things, these are moments in life where people can learn, we can learn, we can grow, we can expand beyond the limits of thinking about just this as a bag of bones and something that we gotta go to war with and connect to it, love it, embrace it, and get well. And if it's not, if it's not our time to get well, then pass well. But anyway, in my experience, and it's not that I do this all the time, I work at a regular clinic and <laughs> this isn't what I always talk about, but it's important for you, this audience. I mean, this is young people. The world is getting better. This is proof. The world is improving and it's been broken. The medical world's broken where Gordon and I come from and it's, it's and we want to heal too. And this is part of the way to heal, to go forward, to expand, to grow. There's so much opportunity 
for healing everywhere, every day, every person next to you, and within yourself. So, yeah, this well, is what I've learned. I have to say, you know, we, we've done 10 of these panels. We started with water and plants and meat and, and the impact, you know, environmental impact of our food choices. And lastly, we did food is health. But our very last panel was on marijuana. And, and just like with marijuana, and everyone is very familiar now with CBDs, and we can buy it everywhere at every grocery store. Heck, you can buy it at the convenience store. But there's less knowledge about THC and the more psychoactive sort of properties of the plant, and there's more stigma attached to it. I think such is also true with mushrooms. We understand they taste good, they're good for us, they have protein, they have these additional nutritional components. Now we understand they can address certain specific medicinal problems as well, they're immune boosters, et cetera, et cetera. But now we're just beginning to hit the tip of the iceberg of truly understanding, and quite frankly, accepting the idea that the more psychoactive plants have something here for us as well. And I can't tell you that in my own personal experience, from just people that I've spoken to, the number of people that I have met that have met with the kind of practitioners you're talking about and have learned about microdosing and these other concepts of, of these, these taking these hallucinogenic mushrooms, actually often in doses that create no hallucinations, they're so small, for a variety of medicinal problems. And what I've also learned is that many of these people are people that I know who are otherwise sober people. So the idea that the stigma that attaches to these, that this side or this kind of mushroom, I think is beginning to chip away. And just like the research that you're doing on the non-psychoactive mushrooms, I expect in the near future, just like is happening with marijuana, we'll see you know real research that's required for us in the West to do the kind of thing in mainstream medicine. But I see it already changing a lot, just in the people that I've spoken to about this. Yeah, just a, a quick statement, uh, and that is that, uh, the, the understanding and the interest in things like psilocybin has just grown astronomically and we're beginning to see states that are starting to legalize, at least in limited fashion, certain uses of this and the, in, the information on this for depression and end of life. And anxiety. Fascinating, fascinating. However, I do want to just make it clear for the record because I have been asked, are those mushrooms that you guys are studying? <laughs> Not those? that kind. And I just want to say, <laughs> No, these are polypore mushrooms that don't have those that range of No, uh, look, and th effects. that's where you are now in the study you're doing, which is brilliant and relates to the kind of mushrooms that these folks are growing. But I think we're going to see the future where there will be research studies that will include this, and I think it's a positive thing. And I think, Mark, you, you, you gave us a great overview on you know, what, what can happen with the mushrooms, what one can experience, and I think that's a perfect lead-in to you, Matthew, to talk about the work that you do in your community and in, in spiritual healing, because that's a little bit of what you were beginning to lead into, the removal of fear, but other kind, and even the, the issues that you raise, depression, anxiety, but spiritual healing with these kinds of mushrooms. So tell us about your own experiences. So uh, one of the first things, I, I've heard a lot of beautiful things today. I mean, you guys have some great minds and it's all led by you know what? You know, this fungi is, is... Our great-grandfather. Great-grandfather. <laughs> you know, I've learned along the way that, you know, I've been in ceremony all my life. I started when I was five. I mean, I was baptized in a sweat lodge. I've been through the oral traditions of, of my people. I've learned so many songs, the song cycles and everything. And I've always asked, how do these guys sing all these songs in one night? There has to be, there has to be something else. I knew something was missing. I've done fasting, four-day fasts. I've done ceremonies for four days where you don't eat or drink. I've done all these things where we're trying to find altered states. That's funny how you brought up uh, sober. No one's ever sober. Who had coffee this morning? Who had tea? <laughs> Who had that tobacco? <laughs> Who had all these things? We are always searching Something. for those altered states. Mm. That's to be human. Because this life that sometimes we live is very hard. The society we live is very hard. We want to get this job or we have to work for this or we have that passion to get that dream. But when I teach the young kids, I teach a lot of kids because I'm a firefighter and I'm an instructor at, uh, at, at, at one of the academies I teach. I get about 90 students. And uh, with those 90 students, I get a lot of uh, military, a lot of Navy, a lot of backgrounds where trauma has been caused. And you can see it, and they're young, 18, 19, 20, 25, 28, going through so much trauma, but we can relate to trauma. And r the real reason I got into this because our family has been into trauma. I've seen 
tragic deaths within our family. I'm a firefighter. I see a lot of tragic things on calls, and those things affect people's psyche. And we always think like, well, how is this, how are we going to help these individuals heal now? Because it's just going to explode later in life. It's going to hit us. And what's, what's that going to hit? Marriage, divorces, your kids, all these things, it all becomes a culture. And that culture is something that we can't pass on. And so what I've learned on the spiritual side of things is to look within, you know, I mean, we have all the answers. The fungi, like I can tell you every single thing that I could have done in some of these ceremonies, but I don't need to. When you have these these, these special fungi like Salasabin Kibensis, you know, these these. What is it? You have, a, you have a name for it. Oh, I call it Matapan. Yeah, you know, so we call it Matapan in our language. It just really means mat, you know, it's of the earth. But fun is like how I sing a song. You guys sing at the, at the end of the song, you hear a ooh, or it's kind of like uh, just an extension of what the song means. So when we say these like Matapan, it's just an extension of what it, what came from the earth you know even us now like I mean there's a lot of things we do that sever us from mother earth alone look at us what we're wearing today we all have our boots on when's the last time everyone's take their shoes off and you're at home walking around with earth you know 7.8 hertz of electricity is coming from naturally coming from the earth right now what well, do you have an electrical node in your heart do you not what are we made of water that has been severed for many years and there's a couple things I like to talk about when it comes to the spirituality of our people and indigenous of humanity is when there was European arrival, what did they find? First, where did they come from? They came from a, a place of great growth and evolved states, right? Well, when you look at those ideas that them coming on a ship and coming here, they find two things. They find humans and nature. And that's one thing I like to reiterate all the time is that they find humans in nature. Every song that our people have have sung or even have passed passed down and you can go anywhere in the world and find these songs anywhere in any description they all they all talk about the same thing how they talk to the to the trees or the ocean or the earth or even the sun but it all correlates to how we spoke to them like I'm speaking to every one of you guys we're having a real conversation and if you know something is alive and real would you damage or hurt that no our people didn't do that don't get me wrong, there was turmoil, there are wars, I get all that. And that's usually for protection, right? But when it comes to the idea of what, what, what Silas Ibn comes from, they were the first teachers. And that's what I learned through all ceremony I've been through. I've been through, been through a lot, and I've seen a lot. And when you, when you, these medicines come in contact with you, it changes a lot within you. When we do ceremony, and you tell that individual when they're going to take that matapan, we say goodbye to them. We give them a hug and we'll cry, even with our elders, because that person will no longer be in this world after they take that. And of course, doses mean everything. And I learned kind of the hard, the hard way. I got kind of kicked into, the, uh, into that big hole, of that rabbit hole. But I'm glad I did it the way I did. But would I do it again knowing what I know now? Heck no. With all my heart, I would say no, because it's, it's that profound. It, these experiences people get are profound. There's nothing to be feared. Just know that your life is about to change forever, and it will continue to change. And there's a saying that we have. Well, I can't really say we. I like to say me. There's an there's a infinite amount of invisible worlds around us that connect us through frequency that will forever fine-tune us for our next cataclysmic event. But what I mean by that, is you're gonna go through destructions all your life, whether it's through a psilocybin experience or without it, without it. But what psilocybin does is connect you to those worlds where you can see past the veil of understanding. You know, they call it the Kashic Records in, 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 in India, right? Well, there's a library of information around us that we can access at all times. And I think this is where the study of our people need to come in. Like, this is what we wanna bring forward. That's a study of consciousness. Who has kids? Raise your hand, really. Ra raise your hand, who has kids? Have you ever seen your guys' kids out there playing in the, like, just with the grass or, or outside playing with the toys? And they're just locked in. And then all of a sudden, you see this perfect moment of them just going like, they're like, wow, I'm really in this place. <laughs> it's, that's the same thing with, with Matapan, the medicine. It gives you another awareness. You guys may think you're aware right now, but when you take these medicines, they give you greater awarenesses and greater, greater, uh, Knowledge, you know, there's a uh, there's a lot of people in this world that I have read about. You know, Terrence McKenna, 
I give my heart to people like that. Or even Dennis McKenna, his brother, and then you got Paul Stamets, you know, people like these individuals that come here to speak about these things that came before us and had to step out of their, you know, their, their, their world that's where it's not accepted, these kind of things. Because they, they paved the road for a lot of us. And I, I think it's, it's been too quiet. It's time to talk about it now. And that's why I came out. I we're never, getting ready. I mean, I think ready. we are getting ready. Yeah. And you find that too, right, Mark? And, and it's here with and now. your patients yeah. and clients yeah, and so forth. Yeah, the world forth. wants way more. Yeah, it's time. It's 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 a growth period whether you call it the you know what you know we went through this period where hallucinogens from 1970, I mean, the 60s were expansive, and then all of a sudden, the 70s, it's illegal, it's wrong. But it's happening. It's happening at John Hopkins. It's happening all over the world. And right, this is, and right, Corona was maybe, was another period of, of fear and contraction. But the bottom line is, the nature of life is expansion. And it is here, it is now. Thank you for what you yeah. said, that is beautiful and right and and i just want to say you know i i make fun of the i love making fun of the medical model because we're crazy <laughs> and and i agree <laughs> and sometimes i mean i just said the same thing oh do you here do lsd or do mushrooms or do peyote i mean you can do it naturally you can go to a sweat lodge you can do bre transformational breath work there's so many ways to access the divine and right let's get out of our heads into our bodies into this cosmos and yeah let's enjoy this ride well and i was just thinking about what you said that you know where the covid has was was profound on on all of us in in so many ways and um there's a great quote that says right after the plague came the renaissance and wow. and i do think that it, certainly with respect to traditional healing, plant-based healing, traditional medicine, traditional spiritual practices, we are seeing a bit of a, of a renaissance of, of these kinds of ideas. And, and I think, you know, I, I won't be quite so hard on the medical establishment. I'm not part of it. You get to do that because, you know, you're a part of it. Uh, you know, it has its place. It does great things. And, and it's just a different model. You know, we research, we have very firm, strict research, and then we say something is, has efficacy. It's just a different process. Whereas we know from Asian medicine, traditional medicine, and lots of cultures around the world who have been using plant-based medicines and others for a long time, they already know that which we will then use research to prove. And that's okay. Both of these systems have value. And it's just good that we're now opening up a little bit more to the traditional. And I, I think it's a wonderful thing. I, I feel like, okay, we moved over to this side for a while. I, I, anybody over here on this side have anything they want to add to, to where we are? Jan. So I think what strikes me as I'm listening to um, everybody's insights is that we're only one part of all of this. And so we can try and plan it, you know, through, through our filters. But that is so limited and um, and to work in synergy and in harmony with the whole with all of of the planet that's how it was meant to be right we're all dependent on each other on and on other entities and, and we have to live here <laughs> we, it, right but it goes wrong when we try to pass it through our filter and think that's the way the world is if we could just recognize that we're, we're a tiny part of a holistic ecosystem and we could respect all of those entities we would be in a better place mm -hmm. the the na the the idea that we don't live in a bubble we're part of an integrated system absolutely we've got one planet to live on at least for now and uh you know before we destroy this one in search of others we ought to just spend a little time paying attention to our connections with it did anyone else over here evo please yeah like on a from a cult cultivation standpoint like let's say with psilocybin and stuff like that what I've noticed with the cannabis industry is it was kind of money, a money grab, right? When it got legalized, huge corporations trying to grow, you know, produce as much cannabis as they can to the consumer, which ended with California, you know, increasing massive amounts of taxes on the final product, which harms the farmer mainly. The farmer, by the end of it, is paying 70% in taxes. So it's very difficult for these smaller guys to continue to do what they're doing. And with psilocybin, like there are steps that you need to take in order to grow them yourself, but it's something you can do in your closet. 
and to have something like a pasteurized substrate or, pa or sterilized grain available for the market for people to actually kind of feel like they're a little bit of a scientist and mix these things together and grow them themselves at home, I think is a beneficial thing for that industry so that people can grow it themselves versus buy it at a store that has some fancy logo with Alice in Wonderland dancing around with twirly eyes and stuff like that. And I mean, I've taken my share of mushrooms and what I've always noticed is growing them yourselves and taking them, that effect that it has on you is a much more positive effect than just buying some shrooms off some guy on the side of the street. You so, know, I, yeah. I have to say that um, I was in Mexico recently and at this farmer's market in Mexico City that, but it's, it's made of, of, of only items from a hundred miles. So it's very organic, started by a couple of chefs. And there's a woman there from Oaxaca and, you know, next to the camote, chayote and chile, are, was a stash of, of psilocybin mushrooms. And, you know, being from here, I was sort of like, oh my goodness. But, you know, it is sort of very normal. It's an agricultural product. She's probably grabbing these, growing in the wild, maybe growing herself. In these mountains, they grow wild in Puebla and Oaxaca and so on. And it's such a normal, I mean, to see it in a farmer's market. I mean, that that's where eventually, hopefully, legally and otherwise will end up because it's certainly not more harmful than plenty of things on the market that 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 are legal and so you know baby steps i do agree with you that that a, that a kind of a populist approach is a good one and that's certainly been true in in marijuana with full legality did come the money grab you're not wrong but also came the ability for people to grow their own and i think a lot of people a lot of farmers uh, and a lot of home gardeners are doing that them, themselves and probably feel similarly about that for themselves as well and the same the same thing with with cannabis when it comes to when it, uh, sorry about cannabis, the same thing with our people. Like when you guys use cannabis, understand at high doses, those are hallucinogenic. You're going, you can see things, you can go through stuff. It's just not just this fungi. Like we we're talking about uh, peyote or mescaline. That's our my Or ayahuasca, side. he said or too. Or ayahuasca, yeah. the, mm -hmm. the, the, the down in South, what South America area. Mm -hmm. But understand, look at where South America and where the met those megalithic buildings that have been built, the pyramids and everything. What's heavily there? What was found at those markets? These are altered states of consciousness that are making these people build these things. It just comes up with more culture. They come up with their own songs. The thing is, you're not going to find anything over there that's not within you already when you guys cross that veil at all. It is just the catalyst to open up the floodgates for you to bring out your gift because every single person here is unique. Every single person here has gifts to bring right now in this time. Don't wait for it. I'm not saying go take your psilocybin cubensis dose or anything like that. Understand that everything that you guys are searching for is not out there. It's in your universe. It's within you. So when you guys go, uh, any Christians here, the kingdom of heaven is found within you, right? That's, that's a, like a profound statement. Quite literally, this is what they were trying to tell you. Everything you need to know about yourself first is within you. Start meditating. Start taking care of yourselves and your mind because you know who's watching? Our future. The reason I'm doing this is because the next seven generations are going to see this. They're going to want to know where it started. They want to know how, how we're going to do it, where we're going to go with it. What's the curriculum? Is there a curriculum? How do we do ceremony? All that has been eradicated a long, long time ago. But guess who were the first teachers? It wasn't a human. It was all our medicine. And that's one thing that's lost. But it's going to be found. And it's coming back. Our medicine has taught pretty much everything what we are. And I think... I think we're at the precipice right now. We're, we're, we're about to see change. I think that's fantastic. And I, I also want to, you know, give people some point of references. First of all, I think you said it, and I think it bears repeating. No one here is saying, you know, go out and find the guy on the street with the psilocybin. No. In fact, if this is something that occurs to you as part of a journey, talk to your doctor, a doctor like Dr. Kalina. Talk, find a shaman. You know, find someone who is experienced with these products before you go out and venture on and, your own. And I want to add to that is if you guys find a doctor in the medical field that speak like these gentlemen, they're gems. To tell you that right now, because these things aren't supposed to be talked about. You know what I mean? Look at what schedule they are. Our own medicine has been scheduled for no medicinal value. Just think about that for a second. Our people have been doing this since the archaic times. It's, it's there. The answers are always within the medicine. 
like we said, don't go go and take it. We're not, we're not trying to say that, hey, this is the only answer at all. Always try to heal yourself first with good food. Try to, before you guys go to any other type of medicine, are you eating right? Are you guys eating everything with pesticides? You know, are you eating everything natural or organic? Start there first. If your mind, if you're having hard times in your guys' mind or your psyche, those are the first thing you guys want to go to first. Are you working out? Are you running? Are you keeping your guys' body and your blood flowing? I started doing yoga with my wife, thank God, for the last what, three years. I hated it. It hurt. Everything hurt. <laughs> I was like, how is this supposed to make me feel better? <laughs> she over there has her leg back here and she's grabbing it. She's like, you'll understand one day. I'm like, no, I probably won't. <laughs> but I can tell you one thing right now, though. That blood flow is needed. If, you don't, if your blood is not flowing within your body, then how are you going to operate up here in your brain? I mean, I'm just telling you, always look holistically first before you go anything else. And then if you want to learn about mushrooms of every kind, the culinary, the medicinal, the other, there's a great website. Mushroomreferences.com. Well, that's pretty so easy. Mushroomreferences.com. Peer-reviewed peer -reviewed scientific articles on a large array of medicinal polypore mushrooms. Their uh, basic science and, and clinical um, effects. This is a, the, the, what we're offering here on average. Obviously, we have a diverse panel, diverse backgrounds, experiences, perspectives. And this is a little bit of a 30,000 foot view. What we hope to do is plant a seed or a spore, as the case may be, and have you begin. If this is something that you think is important to you and your health, the health of your family, Go online, see a doctor, learn more. Read a book. And read a book, yeah. And, and, find, and there's actually also a, a good documentary on Netflix right now, Fantastic Fungi. So there is a lot of information out there. Michael Pollan also wrote a tremendous book a few years back. So I, I just think it's really out there. Say, you know, take some time. We want to, you know, plant some seeds. And I know you wanted to say something, Evo, right? Sorry. Uh, yeah, University of Pennsylvania has tons of information on mushrooms and everything about mushrooms. And they have one of the biggest culture libraries in the world, too. They've also done a lot of research. U, U Penn has done a lot of a research. A lot of research, yeah. And that's one thing I want to add. By the way, like, if you guys are going to get into reading about any of, this, uh, any of these, these items that we're talking about today, please do your research. Research, 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 and read. Read people's experiences. Read about how you know, shamans do things, where they are, where they're cultivated, all these things. There's like a lot of books I've read. If you guys want to read a great one, by Terence McKenna, um, Food of the Gods. It's a great one. The Invisible, Invisible Landscapes. There are many books out there. These people are amazing. They're geniuses. The last note I would say, the medicine, if you're in a search for this, the medicine will find you. And it's how it always is. It will find you. If this is for you. And no, understand, it's, a, it's not like any roller coaster in your life. This is life altering. That's all I have. And, then, and, and on that note, we are going to end the formal panel and uh, we're going to end and thank you again for joining us for Future Thought Leaders with the Very Good Food Foundation. Thank you all. Thank you.